Okay, so uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, pushing up, putting up this, this nice conference. Uh, and uh, thanks to all of you who stayed uh, till uh, that late. I, I imagine you were all tired. So as a little compensation, I'll try to talk about something else. Uh, maybe connect to the talks which we heard earlier in the morning uh, by Giovanni and uh, Alice. Okay, so this doesn't work. Okay, it works. Okay, so uh, my talk is called uh, One Flew of the QQ Nest. Uh, so that's, uh, it reflects partly the, the state of the, of the world, uh, but also has some physical meaning because uh, I will talk about subjects which connect uh, QQ systems uh, and beta ansatz, nested beta ansatz, uh, but also uh, the topic of my research, gauge theory uh, for manifold invariants and mod various modular spaces. So this is, uh, actually, this is connected to the way I met uh, Krzysztof. Uh, I met him probably relatively recently, uh, in 1996, uh, I think. So he invited me to, uh, to a program he was running at in, in, uh, in Vienna. And uh, I was interested in, in uh, supersymmetric localization at the time, so he made me give a series of talks there, and then he invited me to the IHS, which unfortunately I took some time to uh, to do uh, to I mean to actually come to the IHS. So by the time I arrived to the IHS, uh, Christoph already moved uh, here, but uh, we overlapped a few times, and it was always very pleasant. And uh, actually, what I said was not true. My first time I met Christoph was in, in uh, uh, I think it was actually in Leningrad. So. And he amazed me at the time as by his acrobatic abilities. So he was the only person who would, while giving a talk on the blackboard, something you don't see here, he would actually make almost this, uh, you know, the split, uh, horizontal split as to be able to, to, to write uh, at the bottom of the blackboard. So no one else would, would do that. Okay, so back to physics. Ah, shit. All right. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some calculation which one can do in, in gauge theory. So gauge theory in four dimensions. Uh, it's a gauge theory which does not unfortunately describe the, uh, the world as we see it uh, because these are, th these are theories which have uh, extended supersymmetry, but they do exhibit uh, Kind of strong coupling dynamics, which is which we believe happens in 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 gauge theory, which does describe uh, our world, and so it's useful to have uh, have these models because they can be exactly solved and uh, they provide kind of a justification for the models uh, of statistical mechanics and uh, uh, which people work on uh, for many many years. Uh, but uh, now they can be, they can sleep happily knowing that what they do actually has some physical applications. Okay, so uh, so the theory which I'm going to talk about is uh, called AA type. Uh, so it's uh, uh, so there are two A's. One is the uh, so-called the quiver. So it tells you that the the gauge gauge theory has a gauge group which is a product of uh, several copies of the unitary group. It's almost like in a standard model where you have SU3 and SU2 and U1. So here you have SUN to some power R. Then you, and that's actually more general because then you can take limits when reducing the N. So, and then you also have uh, the flavor symmetry group. So it's a global group which permutes the, which acts on the flavors uh, of the uh, kind of quarks. So the theory, sorry, once again. So, so, uh, so you have SUN gauge group, uh, SUN to uh, se several times. So you have several SUN factors, and then you have matter fields which are charged. And the first SUN, they just charged in the fundamental representation, and there are n of those. So it's confusing because you have also a kind of n squared between the freedom, and you also have a bifundamental hypermultiplet which is charged under the second SUN. So from the point of view of the 
of each SUN gauge group, you have effectively two n fundamental fundamental Hanna multiplets, and that's the critical number for the uh, for the theory to have a vanishing beta function in the in, in the uh, ultraviolet. Um, so uh, now there are other gauge factors which are kind of in the, in, in the middle of this diagram, and so they for them they only have bifundamental hypermultiplets. So for the second one, for example, we have uh, the the bifundamental which is charged under the first SUN factor, and then the third one, and then the last one again you have fundamentals and the bifundamental. So that's not the only arrangement of gauge groups which uh, guarantees that the theory is superconformal, uh, but there are actually only a finite number of such arrangements. It's a, it's a pretty rigid requirement. So uh, the supersymmetry allows one to compute the uh, kind of a supersymmetric partition function of the theory exactly. So it means that in the field space, in the space of all fields uh, living in four-dimensional space-time, Euclidean four-dimensional space-time, you have uh, configurations of fields which dominate the path integral, sort of similar to the uh, these multiple trajectories which uh, we saw in the previous talk. So they all equally important, and so we sum over them in the in the path integral, and with the various tricks involving the work of many people. Uh, uh, even Alain Kohn, who spoke earlier about other topics, so using some non-commutative deformation, one can reduce this multitude of such configurations to a discrete set. And so the set is labeled by some ind by so labeled by letters lambda, not to be confused with the lambda which was used by Giovanni with denote exterior powers, but it's the same it's the same letter lambda. And it actually denotes, it denotes a sequence of Young diagrams, which were also featured in, 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 in uh, Giovanni's lecture. So these Young diagrams are labeled by n times r labels. So one is the number, of the node in the quiver diagram, this, this horizontal thing which I had in the previous slide. And the second label is the color. It's, so, so one takes r, r values and another takes uh, n values. By the way, I forget. By uh, h bar, the beauty of supersymmetric partition function is that actually it's actually it's h bar independent, so you can send it to zero and get the exact answer. But you have to sum over all these configurations. Okay, sorry, I, I keep switching the. All right. So uh, in order for, to be informative. Uh, I mean, and that's the beauty of this of the theory with extended supersymmetry is that you can compute something, which, uh, uh, despite the uh, misconception that any the only things which can be computed exactly in physics are topological, so these things actually depend on parameters, and in fact, this partition function is uh, holomorphic or at least analytic in most parameters. So let me spend a few minutes to explain what are the parameters. So one set of parameters is the, uh, I call them vector M. So these are the various various masses. I said that we have various matter fields in this theory, and so they all have, can be given uh, some masses. So we have N masses for N quarks at the first, uh, charged in the first node, a gauge group. There are N masses for the quarks charged under this, the last uh, node. And then we have R minus one masses for the binary fundamental hypermultiplets. So all these masses are complex parameters. Uh, so th that's because we have, uh, uh, so you can, there is a real mass, which is the actual mass of the particle, and there is a certain phase which you can, which has to do with the axial symmetry. Uh, now we have other parameters which are also uh, scalars. These are called Coulomb moduli in, 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 uh, in this domain of physics. These are the vacuum expectation values of the scalars, which are related by supersymmetry to gauge fields. So they're called vector multiplets. And so we have n of such scalars for each uh, gauge node. So we have r times n such parameters. And they are also complex numbers. They're complex because of the uh, nature of supersymmetry. And finally, we have coupling constants, 
which uh, I apologize to Grish, I didn't uh, spell them out more precisely. So these are complex parameters. Each of these parameters is the sum of the theta angle. So it's the coefficient of trace f for Jeff. And uh, 4 pi i over g squared, where g is the cage coupling constant. So the parameter tau is a kind of complex linear combination of the theta angle and the electric charge. And uh, usually we, we you work with the exponentiated uh, coupling. That parameter q is, is what measures the uh, amplitude of having the instanton. So the instanton couples to the particular, particular combination of the gauge coupling and the theta angle. The anti-instanton would couple to the uh, uh, complex conjugate uh, combination. And uh, the supersymmetry, this, the, the supersymmetry which is preserved by the boundary conditions, uh, which I implicitly assumed here, is such that only the instantons contribute to the partition function. So that's the huge simplification compared to the, you know, the thermal partition function, where everything will contribute and it will be a complete mess. Here, you have only instantons. You have only one loop uh, perturbative. Uh, computation to do around the instanton, and that's it. So that's a simplification. Nevertheless, uh, this partition function is sensitive to the nonlinearity of young mills fields. So it knows about the fact that there, is, there are interactions, there are strong interactions. And so uh, it's a nice object to study. And finally, uh, that's one of the tricks uh, of the trade. We have two more parameters, which uh, are called epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. These are, the, mathematically, they're called, these are equivariant parameters uh, for the rotational symmetry of the four-dimensional uh, space-time. So this partition function, you should think of it as a, some kind of a statistical sum of a, of a gas subject to the rotation. So, so this epsilon 1 epsilon 2 are the fugacities for the rotation, chemical potentials for the angular momentum, also known as angular velocity, essentially. So if you are, if you think about, we think about the four-dimensional gauge theory on Euclidean space-time, so I think of this as a, some kind of a thermodynamics over system in four Euclidean uh, dimensions. And so that's, uh, and that's subjected to the rotation. So that's what, what these parameters are. Uh, this is an alternative to the more conventional uh, uh, ways of studying the uh, statistical mechanics of, of, of gas when you put them in a, in a box. Uh, introducing a box in supersymmetric theory is, is tricky, so this turns out to be a alter nice alternative. Okay, so explicit, more explicitly, the, uh, so when all these parameters are fixed, what you need to do, you need to sum over the collection of Young diagrams so Young diagrams are these uh, essentially sequences of, of integers, the n numbers of lengths of the rows of, of Young diagram. Uh, and so as I said, there are, there are two factors uh, which, which, with which we weight these diagrams. One is the fugacity to the power, uh, which knows about the sizes of these Young diagrams. Sizes are just the number, total number of the uh, of little squares, so the total, uh, the sums of the num uh, the sums of the lengths of the rows, and um, and then there is some measure factor which knows about the actual shape of the diagram. I, I wrote here it's uh, uh, schematically. Well, I don't have time to go into de details, uh, but it's it's uh, so it's a it's a certain it's a certain rather detailed uh, product over the pairs of, of squares in these young diagrams. It's some kind of a uh, interaction energy of the instanton gas, actually. So there are some mathematical details, which, is, uh, which I will skip. And uh, sometimes it's useful to, to have an analogy of these uh, models. Between, so these models of random partitions, random young diagrams, they are in, in many ways analogous to the uh, multi-matrix models. So some of, an example of, of a multi-matrix model was discussed in, in the talk by Elise. Uh, so her model had only two matrices. But you can imagine having a 
a model where you have you integrate over the sets of large uh, size matrices. The size is not n. Uh, the parameter n, which I have, is rather a feature of the potential which has uh, n critical points. And then in, in addition to the single matrix uh, potentials, you uh, can introduce the interaction terms, which uh, sometimes is useful to, 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 to think of them as coming from some kind of a fermions, which are attached to uh, fermions or bosons, some bifundamental fields which are attached to the edges of a, of a graph, uh, with matrices being attached to the vertices. And so when you, if you integrate out these bifundamental fields, you get some kind of interaction between the various matrices. Uh, so the random partition model is the analog of the, of the large, of the random matrix model in that uh, the, to each partition you can actually associate a matrix, which will be of infinite size. But the measure on this infinite size matrices uh, is well defined because the eigenvalues of these infinite matrices, which correspond to partitions, assume only discrete values. And so the, uh, the analogy is, is uh, rather precise, but not, not completely precise. So these are different models, although they share many features. And so that's what one does from the physics point of view. Uh, I will skip that again. So the question which one wants to, to, to address is to uh, understand this partition function, compute it if, if possible, or if it's not possible, if it's not possible to compute, maybe derive equations on some observables. And so one observable which, uh, which happens to be a good observable in this model is the, uh, it's called the Y observable. So it's a generating function of the single trace uh, 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 gauge invariant operators built out of the scalars in the vector multiplet. So if phi were a finite dimensional matrix, you can recognize in this exponential series just the, it's a series for the logarithm of the determinant of a matrix. So this whole thing would simply be the spectral determinant of the matrix phi. But because of the, you know, instant on effects, the products of traces of these phi's as operators are not the same thing as the products of traces of matrices. Uh, so there are certain corrections which make, uh, make this operator when evaluated on uh, an instant on configuration, it's actually, so it's, it's not a polynomial of, of the z variable x, it's a rational function. So this would be the classical uh, value of this observable in the vacuum, that's what it equals to. It's, it's just a polynomial in X whose roots are the uh, Coulomb parameters. But with each, with, each, with each instant on, you have a certain number of poles and zeros added. So this becomes uh, a tricky rational function, which knows about all the interesting physical observables. So by expanding it, it, it in, in this Z variable X at infinity, the coefficients of expansion are kind of Casimir's. Uh, so if you know the expectation values of Y, you can compute the expectation values of those observables. Now, uh, so in the analogy with matrix models, one expects that the good observables would obey some kind of dyson schwinger equations. And so even though the, uh, the objects we're summing over are discrete, it turns out that one can come up with a set of interesting uh, relations which are analogous to the loop equations that uh, Alice was uh, mentioning. Uh, and the, the kind of the reason why we have such relations uh, is that if you think about the Young diagram as a random path, so, it's, so you just draw a path on, on a square paper, just like the one I use here, so uh, the, measure, the measure of my summation over this discrete pass is invariant under the small modification. So I can, at, at some point I can make, uh, I can go north then, then east, or I can go first east and, nor and then north. 
And I'm, I'm summing over all such paths. So just like in the, in the path integral when you express the fact that the measure of integration is invariant under small deformations of the contour of integration, here you have a discrete analog of, of this invariance. Uh, and the question is how you, you know, to pack it to, to, to package this uh, this feature in in in, um, in some inefficient way, so it turns out that the, the efficient way of packaging this this fact is to form certain combination of its y observables uh, such that uh, it has a property that its expectation value. So if you insert these observables in the in the in path integral or even in the sum over the random partitions. Uh, the resulting expectation value as a function of x will have no poles. So the individual terms have poles, but the residues between those poles cancel. And that's the, so here's the caricature of this cancellation, which is, which is actually an important lesson for the non-perturbative gauge uh, field theories, because it's a cancellation between the, between different instanton sectors. So this is going beyond the standard dyson schwinger uh, ideology where you do a small deformation of the counter of integration. Here we compare the path integration in different topological sectors. Nevertheless, the beauty of quantum field theory is that uh, they somehow agree even on different, uh, in different uh, uh, components of the field space. So now these observables so this, these combinations, which I, I just wrote, the first term of the expansion, they're called QQ characters. And the reason is that, so the, uh, there are two parameters involved, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. If these parameters are sent to zero, both of them, then this expression actually magically becomes uh, a character of a fundamental representation of a Katsumuji group which, you can, which is associated to the quiver. So in our case, the quiver we are studying is this finite linear graph with R vertices. So it corresponds to the AR type uh, Lie algebra. And the corresponding group is just a group of, it's a special linear group, uh, cell R plus one. So it has R fundamental representations. So the claim is that you can form an element of this group, which depends on, on the auxiliary variable X, by taking these y observables and raising them to the uh, uh, corresponding core roots. And then uh, there's some modification from the masses of the fundamental hypermultiplets. So that defines an element of the group of cell R plus one, or precisely of, of, of the group GL. And then you take its uh, uh, character in any uh, ir irreducible representation of the group, in particular in the fundamental representations. So here would be uh, the exterior power, so lambda, so the i is now lambda i of c to the r plus one, as in Giovanni's talk. And the claim is that the expect the inner limit epsilon one epsilon two to zero, the expectation value of those traces uh, is an, is uh, sorry has no uh, singularities in x, and the con the consequences of that I will describe in a second. Now, it's interesting to just uh, the origin of these observables uh, is so the, the, there is a general formula for for the for these uh, uh, observables to be the characters they they can be given so there is a uniform uniform formula universal formula which expresses them as integrals over some auxiliary spaces the uh, so-called nakajima varieties which are associated with, with quivers and physically I mean, the best way to interpret them physically is using actually the language of string theory, where you you view the the gauge theory, which we which we want to study, as a theory living on a stack of d brains, and then you bring in a stack of or maybe just one uh, d brain, which is completely orthogonal to the space time we live in. So there is some point in the ambient ten dimensional space where where the where most uh, where, where the, the, the two uh, brains are uh, closest. And to the observer who lives on, on, on our space time, like us, it would appear that you have a local operator. 
this local operator is obtained by integrating out the, the open strings which connect this phantom space and the physical space. And by the way, so Giovanni mentioned some phantom spaces in his talk. I have no idea whether, whether, whether there is any connection to this one, but maybe there is. Anyway, so these Q characters are the results of integrating out degrees of freedom of, of some kind of by fundamental nature also. Okay, so now let's explore the consequences of the Das and Schwiller equations. Let's do it first in the limit epsilon one, epsilon two goes to zero. So in this limit, as I said, one packages this, uh, the Y observables in the, in the group element. And so this, it's a, it's a diagonal matrix uh, which is built out of ratios of the Y observables times uh, the uh, number ZI, which is related to the gauge coupling. Uh, I had the formula somewhere before. Uh, sorry. Okay, well, well, we'll come back to this later. So ZIs are related to the QIs, the, the gauge couplings. And uh, so the point is that if you take the, uh, the elementary symmetric polynomials of those uh, eigenvalues, so this is what the trace in the exterior power is, just the uh, coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, and multiply them by the polynomial whose roots are the masses of the fundamental hypermultiplets, you get a polynomial function of x. So that's the, uh, that's the relation. So you have uh, r times n essentially equations on on the unknowns, which are these functions y i of x, which expresses them as the branches of a, so this is the uh, so so this expresses them as the branches of a certain algebraic curve. So so z i's are related to the gauge couplings through these relations, and uh, so the fact that uh, so these y observables, as I said, they, they are functions of x, but they are multivariate functions of x. So it's very complicated functions. We want to find them. For large x, they behave as x to the power n. Um, so this whole expression for large x behaves as x to the power n. And that's the Schwinger equation says that it has no poles, no singularities. It's an analytic function of x. And so the analytic function of x, which for large x it's an entire function of x, which for large x behaves as a polynomial, is a polynomial. And so that's uh, some unknown polynomial ti, which is fixed by the, uh, well, we can, we fix it by knowing something about the, uh, the Coulomb parameters, which upon ex ex certain ex uh, analysis, happen to be related to the periods of the, uh, of certain differential. Okay, so uh, it's it's a bit tricky to extract the uh, y functions themselves y i from uh, from from the uh, sorry from uh, okay so so sorry so this curve so it's, it's a why is it a curve first of all so we have a parameter x so it's a, it's a complex parameter and uh, we have uh, many equations on many unknowns. Um, but we have those, so for each x, it's just a set of algebraic equations. So as x varies, the space of solutions of these algebraic equations spans a curve. So the question is how to, 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 to visualize this curve. So there are actually several curves involved and uh, there, there is a, uh, so the curve which I described is called the cameral curve. It's the R plus one factorial uh, fault cover of the, uh, the, the projective line with the coordinate x. And that's because, so this curve is basically saying that you know what, this, the, what are the uh, elementary symmetric polynomials of the eigenvalues of, uh, of the matrix G R. And so for each, you can act on these uh, eigenvalues by permutations and those give you the uh, sheets of that camel curve. But you can describe it in a more economical way, fashion by looking at just one eigenvalue. And that essentially uh, means that you organize, uh, you just look at the uh, 
characteristic polynomial of the matrix G. And so that's an equation. So setting this to zero will give you an equation on, in two variables, x and, and z. z would be the eigenvalue of G. And so that's a curve. Now it's a plane, plane curve. So it's a curve in the three-dimensional space of x and z. And that's a so-called speckle curve. So the, so the Camel curve lives upstairs. This is something which can be defined for any quiver. The spherical curve is something which can only be defined for this linear quivers. And so that's what, why we, we do it, because it's simpler. So uh, you can think of this just by construction. So if I sit at a fixed x and look at all the pre-images, so all the fibers uh, uh, of, of, of this point on the spherical curve, so these are the eigenvalues of my matrix G of X. So it parameterizes the kind of a, a spectrum of a GL, GL R plus one valued function of X. The multi-valuedness is that sometimes this, uh, you know, sheets cross, so these eigenvalues get exchanged. You cannot really label them in any, in any global way. But uh, remarkably, you can turn this picture by 90 degrees and uh, you will discover that for each value of z now, you will have uh, r plus 1. You will have n values of x for which, uh, uh, so, 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 the, so the cover of the, sorry, so the spec, this, two this curve which sits in a two-dimensional space, it projects on the x line uh, with multiplicity r plus 1, and it projects on the z line with multiplicity n. And so it can be described equally as a spherical curve of an operator which acts now in the n-dimensional space, which depends on the parameter z. And uh, x would be the eigenvalue of that operator. And that operator happens to have a very simple z dependence. It has simple poles at r plus 1 points. And this is. Uh, if you divide by z, it will have simple poles at uh, r plus three points, zero, z1, z, z2, z r plus one, and infinity. And the residues of that uh, Higgs field uh, have uh, distinct eigenvalues related to the masses uh, over zero and infinity, and they are of rank one over all other points. So uh, this duality, which you get by turning things upside, not upside down, but ni by 90 degrees, is sort of reminiscent of the how duality, because there is some kind of r plus 1 times n structure hidden in this problem. But the model itself does not quite, is not quite symmetric. Uh, it's, I would say it's a kind of a slightly, it's a broken how duality because the role of the variables x and z is are, are slightly different. Uh, z is kind of multiplicative variable, x is kind of additive variable. There are models which are, uh, which correspond to the uh, five-dimensional gauge theories when uh, the epsilon parameters become Q parameters, everything becomes multiplicative, and they are more symmetric. So they might be related more in a more kind of direct way to how they are. Now, one can ask, what is this operator uh, L of Z? So what's the, what, what is it, what its origin, what is meaning? And there are two roads to, to understand it. There is a high road, which involves the Fourier Mokai non transform of the, of, uh, the space of, mono, of, of the monopoles, periodic monopoles, so monopoles living on R2 cross S1. I did not explain uh, where these monopoles come from. This is, again, kind of motivated by gauge theory. Uh, but that's the way to explain the origin of this G of X, which depends on X in, in a tricky way, such that it's uh, invariance very holomorphically with X. That's what you get if you start with, with the Bogomolny equation in, in, two plus, in uh, three dimensions, where one of the dimensions is compact. And then you look at the uh, complexified holonomy of the gauge field around the circle, then that would be the, uh, the origin of this G of X, which we had um, previously. And the more direct approach is to derive this lux operator from the 
so-called surface observables and gauge theory. And that's an interesting uh, approach in its own. So in gauge theory, we are familiar with the, with the need to study non-local observables. So the, usually what you uh, get if you think about the lattice gauge theory are Wilson lines. So things which look like traces of holonomy of the gauge field around closed loops. But uh, already from studies of Chen Simon's theory, which Krzysztof actually spent quite a lot of time doing, uh, one realizes that, uh, so in Chen Simon's theory, the Wilson loop actually has, have a dual nature. They are, first of all, they are loops, so they are, they are loop observables. They are, indeed, they, are, they have electric nature, so they are columnists of the fundamental gauge field, but they are also defects. So in Chen Simon's theory, the gauge field has a singularity in, in which it has a uh, non-trivial holonomy around the loop of the Wilson loop. So if you try to generalize it to four-dimensional theories, the, the loops become loops, but the defects become surface observables because they, we need this co-dimension two singularity to define the curvature defect. And so one can study this, this surface defects, which are defined as a, as a, a protocol to perform path integral over the single gauge configurations where the gauge field has a holonomy, non-trivial holonomy around the small loop which is linked with the two-dimensional surface. And so you fix the conjugacy class of the holonomy, but you allow the representative of this, of this conjugacy class uh, to vary along the surface. And so effectively you're coupling a four-dimensional gauge theory to a two-dimensional Sigma model describing maps of the surface of the surface defect into the flag variety, the, the, which parameterizes the conjugacy classes. And that gives you a new set of, of coupling constants because the flag variety has uh, non-trivial topology. So it's the second uh, cohomology group or second homology group is the, uh, essentially the root lattice of the uh, corresponding group. So you have many uh, instanton sectors and you have associated couplings, which I will denote by, by W. And then in the deep brain physics, uh, this is a, also described by the so-called fractionalization phenomenon where the coupling of the gauge theory in the bulk, the four-dimensional gauge theory, gets fractionalized and becomes a bunch of, like a whole vector of couplings. And so that, uh, so introdu int introducing this surface effect modifies the model in a, in a way which, where you start uh, caring about the, uh, uh, the number of uh, columns mod n so there is some coloring, additional, additional coloring you need to perform on the Young diagrams. So it's a, the uh, so the model remains the, the, remains a model of random Young diagrams. You have the same Young diagrams, but the measure with which we weight these Young diagrams is slightly modified, and now it depends on more parameters. Uh, and the beauty of the formalism is that uh, well we um, we, we can, so we organize everything into matrices. So we organize the fractional couplings into diagonal matrices, the, the Z couplings, which are related to Q in the same way to the diagonal matrices. The Y observables, we also organize in the diagonal matrices, but uh, there are also non-diagonal matrices which, which show up. And one of them is this matrix of cyclic permutation with a twist where you put, um, a parameter in the upper left corner. I believe that's the five minutes. Okay, it's the same operator as the e gener either e or f generator, which uh, uh, Giovanni had in, in, in his lecture. And uh, so then, um, so you you now have a an diagonal n by n matrix, n by n diagonal matrix for each i, uh, g i of x. And then you organize the dyson schwinger equations now in a concise form saying that this matrix, which is a product of diagonal matrix and diagonal matrices shifted by the, the cyclic permutation with the, with the twist, as a function of x, has no singularities. And in fact, it's just a linear, linear function in x and polynomial in z inverse. Um, 
And so this way of packaging information into a non-cumulative object is kind of reminiscent of, uh, of what people try to do in quantum computing computers because the secret permutation with the twist is a kind of a high rank analog of the quantum gate. And so you have a product of several gates to, to do that. And it's from that matrix that you can extract the lux operator by just, just dividing, preserving, uh, pay, paying attention on non-commutivity, you divide by the coefficient of x, by the leading term, so that this, this whole matrix becomes x minus something. And that something is the, is the uh, this meromorphic matrix valued function with the rank one residues. So the determinant of that matrix is the equation of the spectral curve. Uh, the, the zeros of the determinant are the branches of the spectral curve. And then uh, for each zero, you have a, a, a corresponding eigenvector. And from those eigenvectors, you can recover the y functions, the fractional y functions, and everything else. And uh, by, by uh, looking closely at the asymptotics of the y functions, you discover that that the partition function of the of expectation value of the surface defect in the limit when epsilon one, epsilon two goes to zero, defines the fact the Hamilton Jacobi potential for a certain Hamiltonian system, which uh, in fact for the canonical transformation in the phase space of a certain uh, uh, certain system, such that the W parameters, which were the couplings, coupling constants for the surface defect, are the coordinates of that system. The, uh, the expansion of the Y function at infinity defines the momentum. The Coulomb parameters, uh, which are the periods of these differentials X, D log Y, are the action variables. And then uh, one can see also the angle variables. So let me speed up. So this is the picture of the spectral curve. Uh, it's, it's a R plus one sheeted cover of the X plane, but it kind of has this lighter structure. So you can also, you can also view it as an N fold cover of the Z plane. And uh, okay, in the remaining maybe three minutes, let me tell you what happens when you turn on the, the uh, not two, but one epsilon parameter. The uh, dozen ring equations remain but now they, they, uh, they become slightly non-commutative. And so the Y functions now become meromorphic functions. They, have, they no longer have cuts as they had before, but they have poles and zeros. And the, uh, the equations which express, again, the, the dyson schwinger relations are that the certain quantum deformation of the elementary symmetric polynomials of the eigenvalues of the symmetric G are uh, polynomial functions of x. So you have to introduce the certain shifts. And the best way to express these relations is, is by packaging them into the generating operator as opposed to the generating function. So what used to be a speckle determinant of the lux operator becomes the generating operator. And the claim is that, so it's a, it's a difference operator in the variable x whose coefficients are polynomials uh, of polynomials in X, polynomials of degree N. And there is a similar story with uh, uh, in the presence of a surface defect. So in this way, all ingredients of classical and quantum uh, zabic written geometry are identified with observables of n equals 2 or g equals 4 gauge theory. And one can also uh, und understand the the place of the role of the uh, of the evolution uh, of the associated integrable system. The integrable system is actually so it has two phases. So the one which corresponds to the uh, uh, Higgs field, meromorphic Higgs field with rank one residues, is the particular case of the Godin model. Uh, in fact, it's a classical Godin model, so it should be called Garnier model, even though it's for um, so it's a Garnier model for SLN with special kinds of uh, residues. And if you turn it nine by 90 degrees, it becomes an XXX spin chain with a uh, spin uh, algebra symmetry SLR plus one. So it's based on Youngian of SLR plus one. 
so it's a particular case of a kitchen system, which could also be reviewed as an integrable system on the modulus place of monopoles, uh, as I explained before. And so uh, let me just conclude by mentioning the, so it's a long, what I just des described, it's a, it's a kind of a very long story. So I've been doing this for many, many years, and the, uh, so it's just a small piece of the recent progress, which uh, uh, I was, was able to you know, achieve with the help of my collaborators, uh, postdocs, students, and uh, mentors. And so uh, especially, so the, la the last uh, few months, we were especially uh, active in this uh, with Edith Kritschewer, uh, thanks to whom I, I understood actually the, uh, the appearance of this lux operator and, and, and lux evolution. Uh, thank you very much. So I hope I did know that. <laughs> the long-term motivation, because it's still apparently you are in the middle of some long journey, right? So uh, for people who look from outside, what what is the dream that you eventually accomplish? Or <laughs> it's like, it's very tempting to give a very philosophical answer. Like the, the goal of the trip, the goal of the trip is the trip. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I mean, originally the goal was to understand uh, is it possible to do the uh, kind of first principle calculation in quantum field theory, which uh, incorporates non perturbative effects. So how, you, how do you normalize you know, the contribution of different incidental sectors? Uh, all those things that people you know, speculated about but sometimes were completely off mark. Uh, so this, in this way, we kind of develop a technology. So you, you give me a microscopic Lagrangian and I give you the effective theory. So the... <clears throat> So this function f, for example, so this is what you extract from the, uh, from the small epsilon asymptotics of the partition function. It's a function which determines the, uh, the two derivative approximation to the effect, low energy effective action. Uh, so by computing that, I know how the massless fields which those theories Possess at low energies, how they interact. So they have. So it's, so it's a nonlinear effective action. So this is some. But so you might hope that one day you would be able to say something similar about the pion Lagrangian. No, that's one one dream. But uh, uh, another thing which emerged. But you see, that's the thing about the scientific trips. Just it's like with this uh, previous talk when you know the, the trajectories can bifurcate or or or, or, or branch out. What, a, what originally started as a technical parameter, this epsilon one, epsilon two parameters, uh, so originally it was a just technical tool to regularize uh, the runaway behavior of instantons, which tend to you know, run not only shrink, but also run away, uh, turned out to uh, become a quantization parameter on, on, in, in some dual picture. And there are two such parameters, and so they, uh, it turns out that these computations which are performed in four-dimensional gauge theory, for some reason, compute uh, conformal blocks of two-dimensional uh, conformal field theories. So this, uh, in the z-plane where my, uh, So it turns out that the full, the full description, so the partition function as it is with epsilon 1, epsilon 2 finite coincides with the conformal block of some, of some two-dimensional conformal field theory living on that z-plane. And, and these points are the points where 
one of its primary fields. It was completely unexpected. I mean, actually, it was expected, but for the not for the gauge, it was completely unexpected on the gauge theory side. Uh, it was expected from uh, from uh, you know, string theory arguments, but uh, what was unexpected is that it actually gives the way, uh, gives the analytic continuation of these conformal blocks, which is something which people in conformal field theory very rarely consider because they're constrained by either by unitarity or by reality or sorry, or by other uh, considerations. Here you get the full analytic control of, the, of this function and then you can start thinking, okay, where does it come from if, I, if I'm a two-dimensional person? Normally in, in two-dimensional CFT, one, one thinks of, of conformal blocks as coming from some kind of three-dimensional topological field theory, but that requires the parameters of the primary fields to belong to, you know, cuts table, to, to be quantized, to, to have special values. Here, all the parameters are completely complex. And so it means that there is some analytic continuation of Chen-Simon's theory, which people also didn't realize existed until fairly recently. So maybe tomorrow when Kansevich will talk about the resurgence structure of Chen-Simon's, he will actually deal with that. But I don't know if he realizes that that's what he's computing. And so one realizes that uh, in order to understand the analytic continuation of Chen Simon's theory, one has to go even further, one has to uplift it to a four dimensional theory. And that four dimensional theory is different from the four dimensional theory I started with. And so when you think about these matters, you realize that the minimal dim number of dimensions where these theories coexist is six. And that means that there, there exists a quantum field theory in six dimensions. Again, something you would not normally expect. So, it's a road which is full of, full of surprises. But uh, I mean, the general goal is to understand the non-perturbative dynamics of quantum field theory and connections to string theory and quantum gravity, which, which I, uh, uh, I can mention one. So you see, the way I presented this was the statistical mechanics of, of discrete uh, nature. So my, my objects were young diagrams, which are some kind of, you can think of them as a kind of a random process. You can you, you have a diagram and then there are so, there's so many ways to add to it a small square so it becomes a new young diagram. Uh, but in the limit when epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 goes to 0, there is, some, there is a dominating shape which, is, which happens to be described by this algebraic curve. And so you can think that that's the way one should think about the ge geometry in general, that the geometry, as we see, is an emergent concept which might which comes from some underlying maybe discrete structure now that discrete structure I derived for you from a continuous quantum field theory and so you have this uh, cyclicity of, of, of ideas but, but so I started with with supersymmetric gauge theory I ended up with some geometry and that geometry required another four dimensional theory so it's uh, you know. <laughs> right. okay Probably everybody just tired. Thank you.